Hi, I'm Scott Tellick, author of the Swithin series of Arthurian novels, the only book series that stays completely faithful to the real medieval legend of King Arthur. Because of that, I've done a lot of reading in the actual Arthurian legend, and in this video we're going to discuss the greatest Arthurian movie there is, John Borman's Excalibur. And we're going to talk about how closely it does or does not stick to the real legend. So it's not about whether it's a good movie or not, we're just talking about how closely it sticks to the actual Arthurian legend. So the major works that make up the Arthurian legend were written between the years 1136 and 1485. 1485 was when Sir Thomas Mallory published Le Mort d'Arthur, and in the century since that has become known as the definitive version of the Arthurian legend. What's important to understand is there's a massive amount of story and legend surrounding King Arthur and his knights. In the 1200s that was written down into the Vulgate cycle, which is 3,000 pages, and Mallory and Le Morte d'Arthur condense that into 1,000 pages, and this movie condenses that into 2 hours and 20 minutes. So the first thing to know is that this movie is a condensation of a condensation of a condensation. And that's the main thing to understand about it going in, is it just has way too much story to cram into 2 hours and 20 minutes. This movie's trying to cover about seven decades and a ton of interwoven characters, and it just can't handle it. But it sure does look amazing while it's trying. This movie opens in the middle of a fiery nighttime battle in which knights in armor are chopping at each other. We never really find out who's fighting who, but it doesn't really matter. It just shows us that in this movie, suddenly this world of fantasy is real and visceral and muddy and bloody. The next morning, I guess, Merlin goes to the lake and all of a sudden out comes Excalibur, like from some watery vending machine. In the actual legend, Arthur receives the sword himself much later in the story, like at the beginning of when he becomes king. So then Gabriel Byrne as Uther is at his new ally's castle and the guy's wife dances for them, causing Uther to get all lusty and say, I must have her. So then Merlin makes a deal with him that he can sleep with her if he agrees to give Merlin the baby that he will conceive. Merlin lets Uther take on the appearance of the woman's husband, and he goes over there and has sex with her, all dressed in his armor, which is witnessed by their daughter Morgana. Next thing you know, the woman has given birth to Uther's baby, and Merlin shows up to claim him. So Uther's hesitant to give up the boy because he wants to give up all that fighting himself and become a family man, but Merlin shows up and takes him anyway. Then some knights, whoever they are, are chasing Uther through the forest, and he dies but not before shoving Excalibur into a stone. Not bad as a way to compress a ton of extraneous story into a few short minutes, but let me just say it takes the first three novels of my series to get us to this point. In the medieval legend, the story begins just after the crucifixion and follows the Holy Grail into Britain right before Arthur's reign. Then my series begins with the birth of Merlin. The second part of the story covers Uther's older brother Pendragon and his reign, and includes Merlin creating both Stonehenge and the Round Table. And then Uther's lust and his plan and his conceiving of Arthur takes up the entire third book. Mallory begins Le Morte d'Arthur with this story, and so does the movie, leaving out a ton of story that led us up to this point. In the legend, there's nothing about the dragon's breath, and Uther never wants to keep the child for himself. The little girl Morgana is alive at the time, but she's not actually in the room as it happens. Also, Uther never has the sword Excalibur himself, so obviously it's not he who thrusts it into the stone. And in the legend, nobody ever calls Excalibur the Sword of Power. Okay, so now back to the movie. Now it's years later and a bunch of people are lined up trying to pull the sword from the stone because they know if they can pull the sword from the stone, they will be crowned as the next king. Arthur is a boy of 15 and he comes to the city with his father and his brother. When his brother's sword is stolen, Arthur runs and grabs the nearest sword he can find, which happens to be the sword from the stone. Now the movie's trying to be accurate to the legend here because the pulling of the sword from the stone is not actually the big dramatic moment we've kind of been led to believe. 
In the legend, Arthur is trying to go find a sword for his brother, and he does just grab the nearest sword. The point being that he's not seeking glory for himself or trying to be king. He's just trying to selflessly help his brother. And the movie's trying to find an analog way to talk about that here. Now in the movie, we have a few moments of Arthur wandering after Merlin, and then he's storming some castle, and then he catches the eye of Guinevere, who looks down from above, just as Arthur is refusing to slay some guy, which wins him the respect and allegiance of the other knights. Two out of three of these things are in the legend. We tend to think that Merlin trained Arthur from when he was a boy, but actually there's no basis for that in the legend. We're probably thinking of T.H. White's The Sword in the Stone, in which a young Arthur is mentored by the aged Merlin, but in the actual legend, Arthur and Merlin don't even meet until after Arthur is crowned king. In the legend at this point, Arthur does have some pretty major battles with people who don't want the country to be taken over by a teenage boy, and that's the part I'm writing right now as I work on book six of my series. Arthur never does refuse to slay someone, but that stands in for the way his men come to respect him because he fights right there alongside them. And in the legend, Guinevere does see Arthur fighting as she looks down from above, and that's the first time that Guinevere sees Arthur and the two of them start to get together. Fun fact, Merlin, as I said, makes the round table for Uther, Arthur's father. When Uther dies, the round table goes to King Leodegrass, who is Guinevere's father. And when Arthur marries Guinevere, he receives the round table as part of her dowry. Okay, so enter Sir Lancelot. In the movie, King Arthur wants to cross a bridge, but Lancelot won't let anyone pass, and Lancelot is basically unbeatable. So they fight, and Arthur can't make any headway, so then he calls upon the power of Excalibur, and he beats Lancelot, but in the process he breaks Excalibur in two, and then he has a moral crisis, but the Lady of the Lake shows up and gives him back Excalibur all super glued together. Okay, so lots of reimagining here. One of the most intriguing things about the legend is that Sir Lancelot actually comes with this humongous backstory that really ties him intimately into Arthur's history and a mistake Arthur made back in the day that he might just be paying for the rest of his life. And it's such a huge connection that I can't believe Sir Thomas Mallory left it out of Le Morte d'Arthur, and by extension is left out of this movie. This scene is trying to both introduce Lancelot as the perfect knight while also offering a substitute for Arthur receiving Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. And it kind of captures the magic of both without really being true to either, so good job! So after another battle, Merlin holds up a lighter and is making a speech, and all the knights are arranged in a circle, and Arthur says, Hey, you know what? I'll build a round table. And then Arthur's getting married to Guinevere, and right at the altar, she sees Sir Lancelot, and she's like, oh yeah, and he sees her and is like, damn right. So Lancelot leaves and goes to repose in the wood where he's confronted by a knight. They fight, and Holy Empire strikes back, the knight is him. He takes a sword through the guts and just shreds, you know, just a few organs, nothing important, and he's a little bit bloody a few minutes later. So what's happening in the scene where Merlin gives the speech is an analog to the Pentecostal oath, which the Knights of the Round Table are required to swear to every year. And this says that they will help women, the church, the poor, and the elderly. As for Lancelot, in the legend, he doesn't actually come to Arthur's court until long after Arthur's married to Guinevere. And a lot of depictions having him go off on adventures because he can't stand to be around Guinevere because he loves her too much, but that's not really supported by the legend, in which he just goes out on adventures like any other knight. In the movie, Liam Neeson as Sir Gawain is tempted by Morgana to bring out the news that there's hot, steamy infidelity going down in Camelot. There's also a Camelot, too, by the way, all of a sudden. And this causes Guinevere to dispute the charge, which means that Sir Gawain and Lancelot have to fight each other as though this is going to prove anything. What's happening there is called trial by combat, and this is where if you have a dispute, the two of you just fight with the idea that God would not let the wrong person win. 
That's the logic. Now you might recognize the name Sir Gawain. He's actually a massive character, second only to Lancelot, and a huge, huge part of the legend, but he's kind of like Blink and you'll miss him here. Camelot does just suddenly show up in the legend, so the movie's actually fairly accurate on that point. Okay, so surely your ears perked up at the name Morgana. She was the little girl earlier who was there in the room as Uther did the deed right in front of her, conceiving Arthur, and it would hap that she has some lingering resentments. She's convinced Merlin to make her his protege, and she learns all his magic and uses it to trap him in the little melted candle room. Then she goes and tricks Arthur into sleeping with her, conceiving Mordred. Okay, so in terms of the legend, the movie's just all over the place here, and it's only going to continue to get looser until the end. In the legend, there are two sisters, Morgan and Margaz. Margaz is the mother of Sir Gawain, and it's actually her who sleeps with Arthur by accident, meaning she didn't know he was his half-brother. And it's she who becomes the mother of Mordred. So for the movie, Morgan, Margaz, and the Lady of the Lake have all been condensed into one character. In the legend, Merlin falls in love with the Lady of the Lake, and he teaches her all his magic, which she then uses to trap him in a rock in a river. And that actually happens right after Arthur's marriage, so Merlin is long gone from the story by the time Lancelot even shows up. So in the movie, Lancelot defeats Gowan, and he and Guinevere run off into the woods to have sex. Arthur follows them and sees them together, and he slams Excalibur down as if he's killing them, but actually just puts it right between them. Lancelot wakes up and sees the sword, and knows Arthur knows, and he shouts, King without a sword! which is your only clue that this infidelity has anything to do with the awful blight that falls upon the land minutes later, requiring them all to run and seek the Holy Grail. Now, in the legend, Arthur doesn't explicitly know about the affair between Lancelot and Guinevere until after the quest for the Holy Grail, and it's not related at all to why the land goes to waste. In the movie, according to Wikipedia, it's actually Mordred's birth that causes the land to go to waste, but I actually couldn't tell that from just watching the movie. By the way, this wasteland is the wasteland from T.S. Eliot's famous poem of the same name. What the movie has left out is something called the Dolorous Stroke, which is, happens much earlier in the saga, like before Arthur even marries Guinevere. This is where a knight of Arthur's grabs the lance of Longinus and stabs King Pelles with it. Now, the knight was too unholy to touch the lance, which is part of the whole kit that includes the Holy Grail, and this causes God to punish mankind by sending three kingdoms into ruin. The dolorous stroke injures King Pelles so bad that all he can do after that is fish, which is why he's known as the Fisher King. Only Sir Galahad, who is Lancelot's son, can repair his wound after he completes the Holy Grail, which also repairs the breach in the land and heals the wasteland. And Galahad doesn't even appear in this movie. So in the movie, Arthur sends all the knights to go out and seek the Holy Grail. Only Percival is good enough to get it, and he brings it back, Arthur drinks from it, and the land is healed. So in the legend, as I explained, the quest for the Holy Grail is set up much earlier, when King Pelles gets injured. So he, the Fisher King, has his daughter seduce Lancelot in order to create Sir Galahad. Galahad comes to court, and they receive a vision of the Holy Grail, whereupon all the knights decide to go out and seek it. That is their only goal, to seek the Holy Grail. They're not going to get it, they're not going to drink from it, it will not become a super weapon. It's so holy that merely being in the same room with it means attaining oneness with God, and it's so powerful that anyone unworthy wouldn't even be let in the same room with it. To my surprise, and in contrast to almost everything we've ever heard, in the legend, Arthur actually begs the knights not to go seek the Holy Grail, because he knows it's going to be the end of the round table. And all but three of them are killed or sent back in shame, and the one who does achieve it, his reward is he gets to die. Not very cinematic. 
And in the legend, Percival actually gets his own humongous backstory, but remains second to Galahad, who's actually the one who gets to achieve oneness with the Grail. Now apparently in the movie, Morgana and Mordred demand Arthur's crown, and when he won't give it to him, they decide to go to war on him. Although I couldn't actually tell that from the movie, I had to read the Wikipedia summary. So in the movie, Arthur finds Guinevere at a convent and she gives him back Excalibur, which I guess she's been holding on to that whole time. Then Arthur and Mordred go to war, helped out by Merlin, who's still out there kicking somehow, and Lancelot swings in at the last minute to help Arthur and they're reconciled. And then Arthur and Mordred kill each other simultaneously, although Arthur lingers for a little while afterward. So the movie's way off on its own now, but it's still rearranging parts that come from the legend. Guinevere doesn't actually go into a convent until after Arthur dies, and Arthur is never actually parted from Excalibur. Merlin is long gone from the legend at this point, and the whole deal with that is that Arthur can't rely on his help anymore. Lancelot is on his way to help, but doesn't arrive in time. Arthur and Mordred do kill each other simultaneously, but what's missing from the movie is Mordred's entire backstory and his whole history with Arthur, which gives the entire thing resonance worthy of using this to end the entire Arthurian legend with. In the movie, Arthur tells Percival to take Excalibur and throw it back in the lake. He does, and a hand reaches up to grab it and take it back in. Then Percival comes back to see Arthur's body on a barge that's flowing out to sea, and that is the end. There's another whole story about returning Excalibur to the lake that I can't even go into, and Arthur is actually not dead, but just injured, and four women, one of whom is his sister Morgan Le Fay, show up to take him to the Isle of Avalon, Yes, the same one from the Roxy Music album, where he will be healed and one day return to save England when it really needs him. Apparently, England hasn't really needed him in all the years since. After all that, I still just adore this movie. It has way too much story to cram into two hours and 20 minutes, and too much even for a good TV series. I'm taking 25 novels to tell the entire saga and all the detail it deserves, and in part it was this movie that made me realize that you need to slow down and really go into all the characters in order for the entire saga to gather all the scope and grandeur it deserves. So while this movie doesn't quite stick to the legend, it's still the only one to even make the attempt. And when this movie does change things from the legend, it does it in a pretty thoughtful way that's still trying to stay true to the spirit of what can be found in the medieval legend. But the real way this movie succeeds is just bringing to life this really immersive visual world that mirrors exactly what most of us have in our heads when we think about King Arthur with Camelot and all the knights and the round table and Arthur, Guinevere, and Lancelot and big battles and everything. It just looks exactly like what you have in your head when you read the actual legend. All right, so there you go. I hope that offered some insight into how to approach what's going on in this incredible film. If you're looking to discover the actual Arthurian legend, you can find Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Morte d'Artur. And I actually have a video on YouTube here explaining how to approach getting into reading this work. You can also look to my book series, The Swithin, which is taking 25 novels to tell the actual Arthurian legend with the rule that I must remain completely faithful to the legend as it was laid down in medieval times. Five of those books are out right now, taking us from the birth of Merlin all the way up to Arthur's first days as king. So look for those out there in ebook and paperback. All right, thank you for watching, and we'll see you again.